Hi guys, my name is Alec Newman. Uh, you might remember me playing Malik in Star Trek Enterprise, and now you are listening to Trek Untold. to Trek Untold, Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. What is a story without a bad guy? Would Robin Hood be as captivating without the Sheriff of Nottingham? Sherlock Holmes without his Moriarty? Tweety without Sylvester? A good guy is only as good as the bad guy is bad, but even the most intense antagonist is nothing without subtlety and nuance. On today's episode of Trek Untold, we chat with an actor who had a chance to develop a very memorable villain who plagued a certain Starfleet crew for a few episodes and left quite an indelible mark on the franchise. And that performer is Alec Newman. Alec appeared during the final season of Enterprise in the Augment Trilogy, where he played Malik in the episodes Borderland, Cold Station 12, and The Augments. This genetically engineered superhuman was the bane of Captain Archer and the pride of Eric Soong and gave everyone a run for their money during that three episode arc. He chased them around the moods of Antares, and well, you, you guys know the line, it's from Rathacon, right you guys can figure out the rest of that. Beyond Star Trek, you may have seen Alec in the sci-fi TV series of Dune and Children of Dune, which we are gonna talk about today. Fearless, The Bastard Executioner, Angel, Casualty, and much more, as well as a litany of voiceover roles in video game series like Assassin's Creed, Dragon Age, The Witcher, Warhammer, and Cyberpunk 2077, just to name a few. When he's not being a malicious villain, Alec is a generous gentleman with a lot of knowledge about his craft, as well as love for the roles he takes on. I enjoyed hearing him reminisce about some of his past work, and his Star Trek stories especially were truly exceptional, many of which I believe have not been heard before until this episode. So set phasers on the highest setting because we've got augments on the bridge today as we chat with the charming and brilliant Alec Newman on today's episode of Trek Untold. But before we begin this week's episode, I want to remind you to follow Trek Untold on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Trek Untold, all one word. You can get show updates, check out some fun memes, and let me know what you think about what's going on with the current events in the Star Trek universe. You can also support this show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash Trek Untold, where you can support this show for as little as $2 a month. At higher tiers, you can listen to the shows before they come out, know about my guests well in advance, and even have a chance to ask them questions, get transcripts of these episodes to make sure you get all the info, and more benefits coming soon, including watch parties and live streams. But that's all dependent on more fans like you coming over and letting me know you want to be a part of events like that. If you want some Trek Untold merchandise, check out our store for gear and apparel, including shirts, hats, stickers, water bottles, notebooks, and a whole lot more. New designs will be added throughout the year, so it's always worth taking a peek. Trek Untold also has an Amazon shop where you can peruse everything Star Trek, sci-fi, and geeky on Amazon in one convenient location. If you're looking for a gift for the Trekkie in your life, or maybe want to see some of my favorite non-Star Trek things that you can get for yourself, check out the link for my Amazon shop in the show notes on the audio version and in the description below this video on YouTube. If you're listening to us on iTunes or any other audio platforms that allow for ratings and reviews, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review to help out this show. If you're watching it on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to us at youtube.com at Trek Untold and give the video a thumbs up and a comment. All of these things help more people find this show and to continue growing and bringing you awesome guests each and every week. Now, without further ado, let's beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. And welcome back to Trek Untold. And now joining us on the show, you know him as a son of Soong, but today he's just himself, and that is Mr. Alec Newman. Alec, how's it going Hi. today? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm doing wonderful. Very excited to talk with you because you're all the way on the other side of the world, too. I'm, I'm so happy that we have the thing like Zoom that allows us to do this kind of thing. Yeah, post-pandemic perks. There you go. <laughs> it really I is. I was going to say that before we started, but it just came out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you saved it for the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
You know, it's one of the amazing things. I mean, that's basically how I started this show, too, was because of the pandemic. It allowed me to do this kind of thing, and it's given me a chance to speak with folks I probably would never have had the chance to, and that's including sure. yourself. Because uh, sure. you're a folk who honestly has been on my list of people to get since the beginning of the show. So uh, oh, this is lovely. it's very, very cool to have you here. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, let's kick things off here, Alec, and I'd like to ask you the question I ask all my guests first in this show. And that's, okay. what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Did you grow up watching it? Ooh, good question. Uh, well, I'll start by answering the last bit. Yes, I did grow up watching Star Trek. Shatner in yellow, Nimoy in blue, um, and uh, the Ohura red. I mean, that that was that was the show I, uh, that I grew up uh, watching, and you know, I remember Shatner's speech patterns. I didn't. I didn't remember them, uh, uh, or I didn't know them as a kid. As as anything except Captain Kirk, but you know, then I got older and uh, <clears throat> chose this profession and did some training and realized, oh my goodness, no one else would quite have done it that way. Um, uh, so I really, yeah, the, the the look and the sound and the feel of it um, was really distinct to me as a child. Um, and then I guess the next stop on the sort of Trek bus stop is is Patrick Stewart and and that you know uh, what do we call it? Well, let's just call it the Next Generation, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, and I've always been a fan, really, really and truly. I, I'm somebody who's a fan of you know Star Wars as well, um, but I think that um, Star Trek has always, always held something very, very special for anyone who's into the business of the imagination, you know. I certainly hope that you didn't think all North Americans sounded the way that William Shatner did. Because if you did, I apologize well, on behalf of all of us. Well, no, not at all. I mean, it sounds terrific. I mean, the thing about William Shatner is, of course, he was a classical actor before Star Trek came along. Yep. You know what I mean? So he was able to bring that kind of, you know, I think he played Henry V in Stratford, Ontario, I believe, you know, before Star Trek came along. And so, and of course, it's one of those amazing things when people who were in these shows at the beginning, they didn't know that it was going to go past a few episodes or one scene. They just did it. You know, they were just doing the uh, the gig. So, um, but yes is the answer. A big capital letters, yes. All right, very cool. Now, uh, let's get a little bit of the secret origin story of Alec Newman before we dive into your performing career here. Uh, so I'd like to hear a little bit about where you were born, who your parents sure. were, what they did, and what little Alec wanted to be when he grew up. <laughs> well, um, my, uh, my parents... Um, I was born in Glasgow in Scotland and um, my parents, Jan and Sandy Newman, um, were actually school sweethearts who, oh, wow. um, with, with a little break in, in between, um, my mother's parents actually emigrated to America and so my mother went with them, splitting my mother and father apart and then they were later reunited. Uh, my father was my father was a, my father was kind of famous himself. My father was the lead singer of a band called The Marmalade. And so um, we were talking about this last week because they celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, my parents. Congratulations. And uh, Yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you. And uh, when they announced, um, when they got married, there was a uh, article, I think, in the Glasgow Evening Times. And I think the tagline was some, my mother was talking about this. My, my Bonnie came back over the ocean or something like that because she came back from... The states where her parents had emigrated them to to uh, be reunited with my father and a bloody good job too otherwise i wouldn't be sitting here talking to you um uh, so yes my father was a was a musician um in in in, in the marmalade quite a, a famous uh, kind of scott rock band and still to this day he has much less hair and his knees are gone but um he still plays in the band and um my mother really brought m myself and my brother up um we moved when I was very young from Glasgow to the south of England. So uh, I went to school in Berkshire, first a place called Bracknell and then uh, Edgebarrow School in Crowthorne, which is now a super academy. But when I went there, it was just a normal comprehensive school, uh, high school, if you will. And, um, uh, and uh, my brother also, I have a younger brother, four years, my junior. Um, so performing uh, for a living was certainly never frowned on. My, my father he didn't have a, a leg to stand on, really. Uh, I think my father was an industrial chemist and he quit to become a professional musician. He literally downed tools and said, no, nah, this is not for me. 
Um, so when I decided that um, I wanted to sort of become a, an actor and work in, you know, the arts, um, there was only ever kind of enormous kind of love and support from from my parents, which is great because uh, um, in many cases, it's the exact opposite. What? What do you mean? You have to become a doctor or, you know, be a, you know, a scientist or, you, you know, go study for the bar or, you know, the, the, the law bar, not the bar yeah. bar. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's a bit about the background. And yes, when I was young, what did I want to be? Well, I had a book about space. This sort of links into around the same time that Star Trek was on British TV. Um, I entertained being an astronaut, uh, like many young boys probably do, maybe yourself, I don't know, um, for a good two or three years. And I, I had these uh, big hardback books on, on space and the planets. And, and um, so that was, that was one idea that I had as, as a young man. But I think I was always, I always, my imagination was always fired. So um, pretty much as soon as I got into the middle and latter stages of school school, I kind of figured out that I, I was amazed that you could make a living pretending to be like other people and stuff. Um, and uh, pretty much latched onto that with the encouragement of some amazing teachers. And I think without that, I'm not sure how it would have gone. But now, I don't really quite know the timeline of how things would line up here. But like when your dad had like reflections in my life or oh, blah, 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 like were you around? Were you able to like see him during those time periods or were you around a little later? Well, so, so reflections in my life was I think that was I think it was 19. I, I, bel I mean, reflections was was early. I I I there was a, a song called Falling Apart at the Seams, which was 1975. Hmm. And of course, I would have been one year old. So the earlier records, no. Um, my father joined the band uh, in, I think, 70 or 71. Okay. So, and he appeared on top of the pops with Falling Apart at the Seams in 1975. And my mother says that um, when they cut to a close up of my dad at the mic, uh, apparently I ran for the TV screen and gave him just a peck on the cheek, you know, <laughs> in close up. Um, so yeah, I was aware that I, 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 but you know, you're a kid, so you don't know any different. I never knew, you know, what it was like to have a dad that wasn't a musician, you know, and, um, and there were presumably, you know, people through the house and, you know, other bandmates, they would meet at the house to drive off to concerts and gigs and appearances and stuff. And it was just completely normal for me as a kid. Yeah, it's really cool that you actually had that sort of upbringing where performing was very much not even just encouraged, but very much like go for it kind of thing. And I'm, I'm curious, yeah. since he was in that world and he was a pretty you know notable person too. Uh, you know, did yeah. he ever give you advice or that kind of thing as you're going on your performing career? You know what he did? I, I leaned quite, I, I, I guess I, my, my dad was sort of delighted to be around when I started out. In fact, I remember, you know, he came to the graduation and uh, um. David Suchet presented our diplomas when I left Lambda. Hercule Poirot himself. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, he's, he's a wonderful man. And I think my dad is a bit of a fan. So my dad at the graduation, we all, when we all were retired to the pub, uh, the handsome cab down from the Commonwealth center in Kensington, where we all got our, you know, diplomas, he was able to buy David Suchet, uh, a whiskey, which he to this day, you know, thinks is just the, just the greatest thing ever. Um, I forgot the question now, because I'd be, I'd, I'm right back there in my head. What was your last question? Now? I'm just wondering you know, how, uh, how he was once he started to get along in your performance yes. career. Yeah. So I, I was mentioning the, the, the diploma day and the sushi whiskey, because my dad loved being around. He loved the, the vibe of, I guess, young people starting out in yeah. the same area that he was in. Um, I remember when we shot Dune, my dad spent a few weeks with me out in Prague, you know, um, and he loved being around. Um, not so much now, you know, um, but when certainly when I started, he was around and he loved it. I mean, he loved it. And he also understood what it was to kind of be a sort of young, young man, a young sort of buck, whatever, starting off. Um, and, and, and really i got i got a really strong start to my career and you know he understood that kind of drive and i think it came from him you know um but to credit my mother as well my mother um taught me about reading and books and how to fire your imagination and so 
between the two of them, I think my dad is a performer and having the aptitude and the stubbornness to stay in the game. And my mother, who's, you know, she, she brought me and my brother up, but you know, she, she, she was, um, or any interest I have in literature is, is, is really to be credited to my mom. And I don't think my dad would, my dad is a reader too, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't mind me saying that, you know? Yeah. So it's a sort of perfect hybrid of bits of the two of my parents that it really is. Yeah. Led yeah. Me into this uh, ridiculous career. <laughs> <laughs> but it is really interesting. I mean, you got the passion for performing from your dad, and then you got basically the appreciation of the word of the text from your mom. And those two things together right. is a very powerful combination in your line of work. Yeah, so. And, and I, I sort of, something I was aware of very early on, I was like, Hmm, okay, that bit's from mom and that bit's from dad. And, you know, um, and, uh, and, um, still fortunately, you know, touch, touch wood they're still around and they come and see me if i'm in the theater or and they enjoy seeing you know shows when they come on the tv and stuff and they're not shy about telling me if they don't like it you know <laughs> there's a movie i made a few years ago and my mom i sent her an, an early pre-release dvd and she watched it she was like i didn't like that it was boring that was boring don't i don't like that stuff <laughs> you know i won't tell you which one but <laughs> <laughs> We'll spill oh, that yeah. tea later on. Yeah, we'll, we'll save yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it was really important to have that support and 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 use that as a kind of taking off point, you know. Well, let's talk about uh, what your very first on-screen role was, Al. Can you remember that? Because, uh, you know, I know IMDb says something. I never trust that website. So, no. Uh, do you remember what your very first on-screen gig was and what you learned from it? So I first appeared in a role in a series called Taggart, which is a Scottish uh, Glasgow set detective show, police show. And uh, originally Taggart was played by a great old Scots actor called Mark McManus, who sadly died. Um, but they kept the show going, you know, a bit like, it'd be a bit like Columbo without Columbo, but it sort of worked because the sidekick stepped up to the, the lead cop role. And then the other sidekick was there. And then they, they were like a duo. So my first role uh, was the, was the murderer in that. I don't think I'm spoiling it because it was in 1996. So, you know, nobody's going to dig through and oh, wonder what happens here. Um, I don't even know if you can, I don't even know if it's available anymore, but it was a three-parter. It was called Taggart Apocalypse about a religious cult that set themselves up in the countryside outside Glasgow and a series of murders based on the seven deadly plagues uh, start to happen. And that's that, you know, three-parter crime to be solved. So I played the misguided son of the cult leader who ends up being behind the whole, the whole uh, malarkey. Yeah. I had stepped out of the National Youth Theatre production of Othello mm. to go and do it. Um, and I was playing Iago opposite Chiwetel Ejiofor, who was, uh, who of course went on to very, very great, great things. Um, and was is, a, is still a, a dear friend of mine. Um, but I stepped out of doing that, um, and uh, because Taggart came along, and um, the biggest lesson I got was the director Marcus D. F. White. We were doing a very simple scene where I had to walk between, I think, two or three pillars. It was like a courtyard, and I had to cross the courtyard. And I kept disappearing behind the pillars just as the camera was tracking at the, you know, the wrong place. And Marcus pulled me aside and he said, Alec, if you can see the camera, the camera can see you. And I went, what? He said, if you can see the camera, the camera can see you. And I never, ever forgot that. I was, I think that was like day three of my first job. I was like, just do your thing, ignore the camera. You know, that kind of, um, you can't ignore the camera. Otherwise you might not be on it, you know? So, um, that was a piece of advice that I, yeah, still, still comes back to me every now and then now, you know, and it's true. If you can't see the camera, then you're probably not in shot. Yeah. It's a very brilliant piece of advice and it's absolutely <laughs> true. I mean, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And so the best pieces of advice are always kind of silly when you first hear them, you know, but thinking about it, yeah, he was, he was right. Bless him. So how did you find your way from that end of the world over to Hollywood? Ah, uh, well, I, I mean, via, via Dune, really. So I, um, I was doing a play in the West End with uh, Kate Blanchett, a production of a David Hare play called Plenty. Um, and uh, Wendy Brasington, who was a 
very lovely casting director. I'd, I'd say was, she's she's still around. But I'm don't, not sure if she casts anymore. For, forgive me, Wendy, if you do, sorry. <laughs> and um, what are you doing now? Um, she had cast me in this play and she was involved with the London end of casting for Dune and she suggested me. Um, and so I, I was lying in bed with a horrible case of flu um, at the time, really, really quite sick, not very well at all. The last thing I wanted to do was get out of bed. And this thing for this thing, Dune came through. Now I had vague memories of a movie, a David Lynch movie, which I had never seen. And I had um, uh, knowledge that it came from a, 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 a you know, a, a kind of classically regarded novel by, by Frank Herbert, which I hadn't read. So I knew next to nothing about it. Uh, my girlfriend at the time kind of kicked me out of bed. She said, you don't understand what this thing is. You have to go. You have to. I was like, oh, no, please. And th this is true. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to sound cool. I had the flu. It was horrible. Um, but I got myself out of bed. I did something I never did at the time and really am loath to ever do to this day, which is get a cab. Um, big on public transport in London, you know, or walking or whatever. But I got a cab because I felt terrible. And I met John Harrison at the Cadogan Hotel off Sloan Square. And um, uh, we did a couple of scenes in, in, his, um, in his hotel room. Um, he gave me a bit of direction. And it went well, but I still felt terrible. And I went home and went back to bed. And then a couple of a couple of weeks later, actually, um, Wendy called me in to do uh, another session, a longer session with John. And I think with uh, with an with an actress re reading in for the part that Saskia Reeves eventually played, uh, Jessica, Paul's mother. Um, and by that stage, you know, when you get close to a job, it, and you get nervous. It's really kind of it's a it's a head game, you know. You gotta keep yourself calm, but keep yourself nervous enough that you can use it. Yeah. So I was a mess because I think I had like a week's notice about this audition, so I was cramming the dialogue and really worrying about it. Really, really getting further and further away from the relaxation I had when I met John <laughs> the first time. Um. Anyway, I did the audition and. It, didn't hear anything for two three days kind of forgot about it i think i phoned my agent once and said oh what's happening with that dune thing anyway i got the job and it was really because of dune that i decided to have a crack at la um i stayed in john harrison's guest house um for way too long <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't take any rent from me um he was very very kind he is still a very very kind man and he as he as he referred to it um I had my first go at the Hollywood shuffle. That was what he called it, you know, going out for pilots, episodes of TV. I'd managed to do a, a little independent film and get a visa. So it really started from there. Um, and, uh, um, and I think I was there for, I was in LA for nearly three years. Um, and I equally love and loathe it. That's a fair assessment. Think, I think that's quite a healthy response. Where do you, where are you, Matt? I'm in New York. You're in New York. I'm in the theater capital of the, the U.S. Yeah, I mean, I mean New York, New York, New York. I recognized when I I, I worked there in in 2011. We toured uh, King Lear from the Donmar Warehouse. We went over to to Bam. Yeah. But the city, I recognized it because I was a Londoner. You know. Yeah. L.A. Different story. L.A. was really. Um, but I, I considered it a fairly healthy response to both love and loathe it. Um, mm. And also my grandparents, who I mentioned before, they had lived in Los Angeles. So I had a kind of uh, kinship with it. Um, some of my friends went there for two, three weeks. They were like, this place is nuts. I'm going home, you know. Um, but I had a at least a, a, some familial connection with the place, you know. Um, which helped me stay there a bit longer, for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really um, that's really what got me over there. Yeah. Um, initially. Well, it's kind of interesting. You talk about having this culture shock going over to Hollywood, and I could definitely recognize and understand that. But yeah. you know, it's not just that too. I mean, you're talking about your first big thing being Dune, which again, we're gonna go talk about culture shock about Dune because you're going from different kinds of sets now, these enormous lavish things, a lot of green screens work as well. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I would assume it's safe to say you've never done anything at that point in your career quite like Dune, right? No, and I, I had also never taken responsibility. Not that I was particularly aware of it, which I think helped help me stay sort of reasonably loose and free of any, oh God, you know, kind of free of any ideas you know, <laughs> about what it really was. Um, and I remember a good friend of mine at the time, who's also an actor, sitting me down in London before I traveled to Prague and saying, do you, you do understand what this is? You understand that Star Wars would not exist without Dune. There would be no Tatooine. There would be no, you know, there would be no um, sense that Luke Skywalker in Star Wars is chosen. That's all from Dune. You know that, right? I was like, what are you talking about? What is, you know, and I'd read the novel by then, but I was like, oh God, okay. So, so I didn't speak to that friend for a few weeks because he made me really nervous. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Dune and, and, and not least, working with someone like Vittorio Storaro. And again, I knew that he was a much lauded world famous cinematographer. But if I understood about him what I understand today, I it would have made me again really nervous. I would be like, oh my God, this is Vittorio Storaro. You know, we just got on with it because I was 25 and then 26 because we shot for that long. Um, and it was really, like I said before, the, the, I had never taken responsibility. I had never shot almost every day, almost every scene. Um, so as a training in itself, for the rest of my career, it will probably stand as the biggest kind of chunk of uh, growth, I suppose. Mm. Not that I was aware of it at the time, because you never are, because you're 25, 26, and you don't know what, don't know which end is which, which way is up, you know? <laughs> So, yeah, it was, it was a, the, the older I get, the more I realize what a huge kind of you bend in my life that was, you know. Yeah, and it's a big role in so many ways, because not only just the fact that you're a lead in this enormous production, it's also the fact that you're stepping into the shoes of Kyle McLaughlin, who really made that role in that initial movie. And, yeah. uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about actually about how you approach the character of Paul Atreides, because hmm. I, I watched an interview that you did, in fact, about him, and you used the word Messiah, and that's really the correct word used for Paul. Um, but he's also the reluctant Messiah, so it's very much like that, that Joseph Campbell hero's journey that we hear about all the time, and that's very apparent in sci-fi media. So, hmm. you know, I feel like having watched it, you know, like you kind of approach this in... Really, it was a very novel way, as, as opposed to what Kyle did. You, you made this very much more of a religious way. So, you know, when you look at this material... What was your take on the character and where you wanted him to go by the end of that initial series? Yeah, that's a really cool, interesting question. That's really well observed because, um, first of all, I never saw uh, Kyle play Paul Atreides. I never saw that movie until after we were finished, deliberately. Um, so, and, and secondly, John and I talked at great length I mean, I, I had, a, I think I had two, maybe three weeks in Prague before, you know, pre-production. Um, and Prague's a great city because I would take the novel and go for dinner, sit, you know, read a few chapters. It was, it was such a great way to prepare, you know. Um, and uh, I also um, talked with John, like I said, about the religious elements of Paul Atreides, the idea of a messiah, the idea that they were the de this desert people, the Fremen, um, excuse me, and the essential idea that one man's freedom fighter is in fact another man's terrorist. Yeah. Um, and that was really what really hooked me when John started talking in those terms, because in in any genre, particularly sci-fi, you know. There are goodies and baddies, you know. There is Khan Noonien Singh and there is Captain Kirk. There is Luke Skywalker and there is Darth Vader, you know. But what's really interesting, um, I think as writers and actors, is to find the exact opposite. For example, it's not an accident that George Lucas, a Darth Vader's mob are called the Empire. Well, the Empire is usually like the good guys who are trying to civilize these you know, you take the British, you know, rampage, whatever you think about that, rampaging around the earth, stealing everyone's stuff and civilizing them. Yeah. That was the British Empire. And we're supposed to be the goodies. But I was, I was quite fascinated with the idea that this young boy, um, played by someone who wasn't 
that young, but that was the decision that they made, um, became a, a freedom fighter in the desert on a planet that he was not from hmm. with a set of beliefs and religious ideologies and fanaticisms that um, he very slowly became aware of. That was really interesting to me because that, you know, and bear in mind, we made this in 99 to that Iraq was happening, all the pretext and, and the mess that that became was all kicking off. Oil is spice, you know, um, you know, uh, how do we know what they're telling us about Saddam Hussein? Is it just the media or is it, you know, weapons of mass destruction, Baden, you know, Colin Powell with a little vial of what is that? Um, you know, that was all happening. And um John talking in those terms became fascinating because it made it, it very immediate and very relevant. But for playing the character, I went, I went, I read the Quran. Hmm. So I was this guy wandering around Prague with a copy of the, you know, a small edition. I didn't get a big leather bag, you know, I, I read it because I, I had a suspicion that that's maybe what Frank Herbert was, that that, that was the area that he was getting at. Hmm. Um, the, and the, and so I wanted to understand, having understand nothing about it, I wanted to get an understanding of how that worked. Um, and I think it helped. If it didn't, I've read the Quran. <laughs> and, you know, um, there definitely is this kind of you know interesting thing I noted about the character too. How there is kind of like this growing intensity over time of the character and the strength of his beliefs. So I think it yeah. definitely it kind of shows what you did. Like the research that you put into it definitely shows in the yeah. role that you performed. I mean, it, you know. It, it, <laughs> The other thing I've been talking about Dune a lot recently for obvious reasons. The other thing about it is it's trends in film and television and the way stories are filmed and the way things are scripted change all, all the time. John's script, John's screenplay for Dune and Vittorio's cinematography for Dune were both knowingly and deliberately theatrical because John's um, not so with Greg Utanis. You know, Greg is like a bridge between how things operate now and how things operated when we did the first miniseries, as far as I'm concerned. And he's a very brilliant director. I mean, he's just finished the, um, the Game of Thrones, you know, um, sequel and, and is one of the dons of television worldwide. So, you know, it went pretty well for Greg, you know, <laughs> he's great. But, but when, but the original miniseries, John had picked up in the book a certain theatricality, a, a, a sort of Shakespearean operatic quality in Herbert's writing, which isn't a million miles away from Star Trek, funnily enough. Yeah. Uh, and when we think about Shatner being a Shakespearean actor before they cast him in that show, um, it starts to make sense. And as I say, tastes change, you know. Um, I still haven't seen the Timothy Chalamet performance. I'm waiting until the second one comes out, I think, so I can watch the lot and kind of replicate the experience of ours. You know? But I'm willing to bet that what we're talking about here, the conventions of how you act on camera, how things are written will be evident. You know, and I love that director, Danny Villeneuve. I just think he is the perfect choice to direct that version of what is a timeless uh, story, you know, so. Uh, so yeah, I want to talk one last thing about Dune, by the way, and that's your fight scene at the end that you have, because that fight scene, it's a pretty critical scene in the original movie. It's one, I think, of the more well-known parts. I originally had Sting in that scene as well. Uh, so, you know, for your version in Dune, again, big, amazing set you guys have, very different from that original David Lynch film. Uh, so just tell me what you remember from that day and choreographing that fight scene, and just really how that is essentially the culmination of the entire three episodes of that miniseries. So we shot that scene very near the end of a 16 week schedule. That's a long schedule. But my first rehearsal for that sequence was um, in the f on the first day of the three weeks of pre-production. Hmm. So we had been um, me and uh, firstly the double and then Matt Kiesler, who played Fade. Um, I think there were only two or three moments in that sequence as as completed where the double appears. We managed to do almost all of it ourselves, apart from, you know, the backflip and all that other stuff. Um, but yeah, we had weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to very slowly put that sequence together. Hmm. Uh, build up fitness. Um, I don't think I've ever been so fit in my life as I was by the end of that 16 weeks. Um, 
and working with a, a very brilliant stunt coordinator who's very old now, but he was an Olympic wrestler in a former life called Peter Drozda. He was a stunt coordinator. Uh, when Prague in the early, late 90s and early 2000s, because it was so cheap to film there, everyone was going there, you know, um, and he was working all the time. Um, so, yeah, we we rehearsed it for weeks um, and we shot it, I think, across two days. Um, we shot everything wide. We did do the fights uh, with the flip sequences and that cut out and we'd reset. We did do master takes of that fight. Uh, Vittorio wanted a kind of uh, formality, a sort of um, Japanese formality to the way that it was shot. Yeah. So it shot very, very classically from the side. Um, we did all that on the first day, as I recall. And then the second day, the doubles came in and did their pieces. And then we shot close ups and pieces and little bits of the fight tighter. Hmm. Um, so, um, and I do remember John talking to us. It was a very deliberate uh, cinematographic approach to focus on the ceremony uh, as a way of upping the stakes. Um, he even had the, I mean, some, a lot of people hated it, but I think it's brilliant. He even had the guild navigators go across the frame like that as the politics moved. You know, they put their, they put their chips with, with who they think is going to win. And there's a point where they, you know, after the fight's complete, they just all shuffle across the frame you know, with the pointy hat. And that formality was helped by uh, Mr. Piszczek, Theodore Piszczek, who's still with us, um, a very brilliant designer. He had designed these ceremonial. I mean, I basically had a, I'm looking at a picture of it on the wall, actually. It was a bit of a Japanese kimono. Um, mm. We even had the, the head thing. And that came off before Paul comes down, as I recall. Onto the floor. very ceremonial. The the focus was very much on the ceremonial aspect, um, um, and we had had weeks to prepare the the fight itself because there was a lot going on in pre production. So we, you know, we didn't we didn't um, nowadays. You know, you'd probably meet a stunt coordinator three days before and you'd stick it together, and the doubles might do lots of it. But we were very fortunate, Matt and I, that we could we could shoot what we'd been working on. It was quite satisfying, actually. And yeah, my dad yeah. was there. That was one of the days that he was there. Yeah, it's a very cool looking scene. And it did remind me, you know, now that you're telling me the, the sort of Japanese cinematography roots in it, it felt like if I was watching a Kurosawa film. It felt like there was yeah, no, no. kind of, you know, mean, the, that almost like weather and ambience in the background too. It's happening. Yeah, it felt very much rooted in that kind of mystique. I mean, it's it's a physical it's a physical representation of a political shift. That's how yeah. John, John talked about it. You know, we tell, that's quite cool. Well, Alec, I want to talk about one more thing before we jump into our Star Trek discussion here. And I found this hiding in the dark corners of YouTube, but uh, I was able to find uh, your performance as Dr. Victor Frankenstein in the Hallmark Frankenstein film. Oh, yes. Yeah, which also has William Hurt and Donald Sutherland and Luke Goss okay. as the monster in it. And uh, yeah, it, it's really it's a really great movie. I mean, number one. So anybody out there who wants to see some excellent work by Alec, check that out. Just a good movie. Um, well, but fine. I also really appreciated your take and again we're just talking about what you did for paul atreides in dune what you did for victor von frankenstein as well it's very much kind of a different take and especially at that time of what that character was of i guess you could say the stereotype of the mad scientist and uh, right. you know i'd love to hear again a little bit of your thought process of how you approach this character who is such an iconic really cliche in some ways uh and found a way to make it refreshing oh, that's really cool because I said earlier, I'd never shot anything every day for 16 weeks. And, and that was another one. This, 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 this was another one. So there's parity between that and Dune, actually, because both were adapted for television and both remain more faithful to the original novel than you would be able to facilitate both in running time and well, running time alone, really, if it was a movie, if it was a one off. Um, and Obviously, this parity too with the great William Hurt again, who I you work with somebody once and you're in awe, but you, but I I had some sort of I think paternal father son thing going on with William as well, which again the older I get the more I value it. Particularly now he's gone, he taught me an awful lot. That man, he's he's a he was a great great actor and wonderful screen actor. And so when he when he went, I realized a lot of the things that he had you know, taught me almost by mistake. And he would be embarrassed. He wouldn't like that. You know, oh, stop it. You know, but 
Um, he was a very great teacher and a, and a very kind man. Um, but that thing about being true to the book um, was fantastic. And yeah, to get away from the zany, you know, because um, there is a there is the literary history of these projects and there is the cinematic history of these projects. And the cinematic history of Frankenstein is dictated by the um, Karloff bolt through the head, you know? Yeah. Um, which isn't in the book. It's not in the book. That, that That's just the thing that they, that would be great if it was this. And again, trends about how things were scripted and shot come into this. So most people think that, you know, Frankenstein is, is the monster. It's not, it's, it's Victor, you know, that's his name, John Smith, Victor Frankenstein. And in, in fact, in the book, it's the creature and Luke was playing the, the creature. Um, and the thing about Luke Goss is when I was a kid, Bross were at number one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and he had, he had carved a wonderful, you know, career out for himself with, with one amazing performance in Blade, um, Blade two, I think it was, you know, and he has this amazing bone structure. So, you know, you put the camera on him and it's just like drama. <laughs> He's yeah. doing nothing, you know? Um, so that, that was, that was a, a real, um, pleasure. Um, and then they brought in Donald, Donald Sutherland to play Captain Walton. Um, and again, I talked about William earlier and about being fortunate enough to be around these great actors, but um, D Donald as well, just, you, you can't help but learn, you know, being around. Um, and Donald, he doesn't suffer fools gladly. I will admit this. He, he, uh. he knows, he, let's say he knows the conditions under which he can do his work. And if we deviate from that, he do, he's not shy in telling people, you know, um, like he sent me back to my, I was smoking at the time. Sorry. And uh, he was a, an ex-smoker, so he sent me back to my trailer to brush my teeth after asking me if I had been smoking. So I, you know, I said, yes, yes, I did. Like, go, and, go and clean your teeth, please. <laughs> yeah, I do think it's interesting what we were just talking about with Paul and Dune and how you kind of looked at it. Uh, I feel like it's very much similar kind of story here, in your case of Frankenstein, where there's this kind of like gray area of what's good, what's bad with him. And that's what I liked about what you did with him, too, was it felt like he was so optimistic uh, and, you know, he was looking for this and he, he had like these goals and they were like altruistic goals, but really they ended up not quite being that way. And, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of great back and forth you have with Luke Goss, very complex relationship between your characters that is, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I guess a good comparison Trekkies look at this. It's almost a little bit like Kai Wynn and Kira Norris. Uh, yeah. And just, you know, like we know which one really is the bad guy, which one's a good guy, but there's always a little bit of gray area in that. And I found that really great. Just, you know, what you did with your character and also yeah. the back and forth you had with Luke. There, yeah, there's, um, there's a lot in the Mary Shelley novel about God. Hmm. And uh, I remember one line that William had to me, it was a scene in a graveyard, only God can create life, Victor, only God. And it's a science fiction novel, let's face it. I mean, it's the original science fiction novel, you know, Frankenstein. It's not set in space, but the definition of science fiction is that it doesn't have to be set in space. It's just, that's where we went with it. Um, and it's it's gothic horror and um you were mentioning earlier about the you know the, these elements are the keystones into how to play these roles i guess that the reluctance of paul atreides to become who he realizes he is destined to become and the pain and the angst that that causes him particularly in the second miniseries children of dune um there is a there is a religious element to Victor Frankenstein that Mary Shelley put in the character, whether he's aware of it or not. The sense that he has done something not just wrong, but ungodly against the code of humanity, you know, mm. something um, maybe evil, but definitely immoral. And um, it's those struggles that I think you're, you're talking about. And Again, I have to credit Kevin Connor who directed that. He was, there were lots of, I mean, I was young and I was lapping all this stuff up. You know, I got to play these great parts, but if you don't have a director that talks to you about these arguments, um, you're, you're just pulling faces. You're pulling faces, you know? It has to be going on in your, 
your mind there has to be something that's consuming you that isn't just when do i say that and when do i move you know there's got to be something behind that and increasingly at least in film and tv these days sometimes that bit of a process can get missed because you have to hurry up we need it now and we should have shot it last week and um i just want it to look cool and that's fine it, it, but if it looks cool and it's got nothing else going for it there's a lot of you can spin through netflix and amazon for hours and everything looks cool everything looks cool now but it's got to have a it's got to have a bit it's kind of beating heart you know um and so with both these projects that you're that you've mentioned um you're reminding me now that was kind of the case trek untold will return momentarily Trek Untold is sponsored by Triple Fiction Productions. Celebrating 15 years in business in 2023, TFP creates 3D printed Star Trek and sci-fi inspired items that fit into any collection. Whether you're a cosplayer who wants a Starfleet phaser, Bajoran tricorder, or a Klingon dagger, or a toy collector looking for that special accessory or diorama to make your figures truly stand out, Triple Fiction Productions has exactly what you need. And for you figure fanatics, that includes products that are the perfect size for Galoob, Nego, Playmates, and everything in between. All products are 3D printed in the US, with new designs constantly being updated on their website. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free which is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, which is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, where the more you order, the more discounts you receive. TFP also has a pay what you want section where clearance or misprinted items are available at a discounted price. Best of all, every product can be shipped worldwide. As a special bonus for listeners of this show, Trek Untold has a special discount code just for you. Enter UNTOLD10 at checkout for 10% off of all orders with no minimum purchase required. That's 10% off using UNTOLD10. To see all of their products, head to triple-fictionproductions.net. Or to stay up to date on their newest products, find them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Triple Fiction Productions, where something is only impossible until it happens. Are you looking for the perfect fashion statement to show you're a geek and proud of it? Well, welcome to Geek Girls Castle, where I make fun and functional geeky clothing and accessories for every occasion. My name is Missy and I started creating my own gear and apparel in 2015 to bring nerdy products to the geek girl population, which does include all LGBTQA+, non-binary, and POC and BIPOC folks. I couldn't find anything for us gals except t-shirts, so I decided to combine my passion for fashion with my fandoms, ranging from handmade skirts with really large pockets, travel accessories like toiletry bags, luggage tags, and zipper pouches. I also embroider nerdy items for home decor like wall hangings and hand towels, and products like keychains, bookmarks, and journal covers. Need something to carry all that in? Well, I make great bags to put all those accessories into or onto. Whether you like Star Trek, Star Wars, Doctor Who, Marvel, DC, and everything else in between, there is something for every geek girl. My website is constantly updated with new styles and fandoms, no matter what time or dimension you come from. If you'd like to browse my products or ask for something custom, visit me at geekgirlscastle.com. That's geekgirlscastle.com. Have you ever watched a YouTube video and said you wish you could do what they were doing? Whether it's the filming, the production, the editing. Maybe you listen to your favorite podcast and you wondered how they put that show together, how they got that great sound quality, what gear they use. How much does it cost to get started? Or maybe you checked out a video or read a book about one of your favorite entrepreneurs and it made you say, I want to live that life. I want to do what they do. Then check out my podcast, Toys and Tech of the Trade. I'm Rich Butler and I've been making podcasts for almost two decades, speaking with experts across all fields to get to the bottom of the hows and whys of their achievements. Each week I sit down with these amazing people who have carved their own path in life and share the gadgets, the gear, and the tech that they rely on to create their content, the methods that they use to run their business, and the habits and trends that are part of their daily routine and their way of life. And all of that, of course, gets put together to make them successful. We pull back the curtain on the process to help you understand what these people do differently so that you can draw inspiration and get ideas and be inspired so that you can take action today. 
This podcast is inspiring, educational, it's enlightening, and most of all, it's a lot of fun. I want you to join me on this journey so that you can use the tools and advice shared in this podcast to level up your business or creative endeavors, giving you all the tips, tactics, and tools so that you can transform what you're doing from a side hustle into a full-time lifestyle where you can collect a paycheck for doing what you love. Check out Toys and Tech of the Trade wherever you listen to podcasts and check out the RageWorks Network at RageWorksNetwork.com for more info on this podcast and all of the many other great shows that we have on the RageWorks Podcast Network. That's Toys and Tech of the Trade. All right, so Alec, let's beam into our Star Trek discussion here. And you entered the franchise in the final season of Enterprise as the augment named Malik. And three episodes of that show, starting with Borderlands, following that Cold Station 12, and wrapping this trilogy with the Augments. So uh, let's just start here beginning. How did you get cast for this role, and had you auditioned previously for any other Star Trek roles? I hadn't auditioned previously at all, and when the audition you know, notification came through, I kind of, it was a very surreal moment, because Star Trek was a big part of my childhood. And uh, here I was getting asked to go in for not one, not two, but three episodes. <laughs> and uh, so I think it was Libby Goldstein was casting at the time. And I went along. Um, I had done my prep. I had learned my lines. I had an idea what I wanted to do with the character. The audition was OK. You know, uh, it wasn't I didn't leave thinking, yeah, that was great. I was like, uh, it was a gray area, which is usually a good sign. But I only know that now. I didn't know it then, you know. Um, and yeah, I was cast. Uh, via via that session and absolutely delighted you know surreal yeah. to be asked to be a, a part of a, what is a vast universe of fictional worlds uh, but also actual actors you know yeah. <laughs> thousands and thousands of people that have been involved in it and you definitely dodged a bullet by not having to be some weird prosthetic covered alien you got to be essentially a human just a super powered human yeah i dodged a bullet somewhat but i didn't dodge the you know the spandex lycra yes body you did not <laughs> or the wig i didn't dodge the wig i mean that was some wig i'm only a few inches off the wig now actually i could probably you know just <laughs> um but uh yes i didn't have hours in prosthetics you're you're right so i was grateful for that but you did have, a, like I said, the spandex. And you know, I got to ask, it's just a weird Trekkie observation here, but the augments are super smart and super strong. But if they're so smart, why can't they get clothes that don't look like Swiss cheese? Like those things are just covered in holes. Yeah, I know. Look, I mean, you're not going to pick holes in this. Are you? I'm joking. It's a joke. <laughs> um, I look, I, a I, clap for that. I know. <laughs> you are so funny. Why don't you do comedy? Uh, I know. Uh, my guess is is, is is as good as yours is to do with the mythology of those characters isn't it you know the the uh the wrath of khan element the pull through of those those characters but um yeah i can tell you it was tight <laughs> yeah. well let's talk about working with your on-screen dad if you will in this case that would be brent spiner a star trek wow. royalty and just royalty in the acting world across everything he's done uh so you know tell me a little bit about what it's like to be working directly opposite with him and also what he's like off camera um i'll start with the off camera he's i mean he's royalty as a, as a human being he was um i don't think he has an ego if he does he disguises it extremely well he is the nicest most open uh, welcoming man you know he's one of those actors and i think it comes from supreme confidence i think when people are very confident they they can afford themselves that level of relaxation in their work it's something that i really aspire to and don't always nail, you know, um, uh, um, and obviously his work is effortless. I mean, he knows the Star Trek world uh, inside, obviously he played data, but, um, the, the, his, his com that's his, you know, he's really in his comfort zone in that world. And so I could kind of tag on to that level of relaxation and, and try to do something that if you were a bit tighter, you might not be able to attain, you know? Mm. But he's just, he was incredible. Yeah, it's, his generosity of spirit as well is a, is a vastly underrated uh, thing nowadays, you know. And what's interesting today in this podcast is I didn't even realize this, but like the things we talked about, they all kind of have some sort of complicated father-son relationship, I feel like, in these characters. Yeah, I know. And, you know, it's the same thing with, with Malik and with Dr. Yeah. Singh. And, you know, the thing is, I, I've known that for the fact that most times Star Trek shows don't really get time for rehearsal. It's kind of like you just go. 
So I'm curious how you and Brent managed to get this really great on-screen rapport where it really felt like parent and son. We, yeah, we did. I, I don't recall having a great amount of time, if any, to really talk about that. Um, so it's almost like you're, you're right. You know, you have to shoot, do it. The best way to do it is to roll the camera and see what happens and then, and then tidy it up, you know, um, and hope that Libby Goldstein got it right. You know, um, I hope it's Libby Goldstein, by the way, I've, if I got that wrong, I'm so sorry. Uh, who was casting? So, yeah, anyway. Um, so we, there weren't great discussions, as you say, um, it, in a way that makes it sort of potluck, but the, um, dynamic of how it worked is I brought what I had and in the scenes we had together, he, we had, I think we had one fairly long scene head to head. Mm -hmm. I seem to remember, I'm not sure which episode it was in. It might be the middle one. Um, but what I found with the writing is that it facilitated, you know, it, it pushed you in exactly the right direction. So it was more a case of just not getting in the way because okay. the, 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 the scripts were delivering something in terms of that father son relationship, as you said. So it was important not to get in the way of that and let it breathe a little bit, I think is the way that we did it. And, and there's nobody better than Brent Spiner letting, you know, letting a scene breathe. He's, he's a master. Yeah, Malik is kind of like this coming of age puberty character, but he's also trapped in arrested development in a lot of ways mentally. Uh, you know, he's mentally stuck in one world, but he's got the body and the hormones of a superhuman. So you got this great material to work with. So what did you do to formulate who Malik is and who he was on screen? That's a good question. The scripts were really helpful, and that's not to be underestimated. You know, um, you, uh, I, I tried to. I, I think I tried to lean on the relationships um, because what was important to me is that you know he is basically a pubescent, uh, misguided superhero in a way. Um, and so to focus more on his relationships, um, uh, Abby Brammel, who played uh, Persis, you know, we had a lot of good stuff together. And so the writing had facilitated us being able to see the elements of what was really going on inside him so that when he starts throwing people into um, chambers full of poisonous gas and, and throwing Archer around, you understand, you have a bit of leverage, you know. You're not just some hooligan. Um, having said that, it was important to keep that element of him because that was in the character brief. The first time I read any of the material that he is, you know, essentially a, a ruffian, very physical, um, not afraid to use force. In fact, more allied to using force than talking. I think that's in the script too. So it was a balancing act, really. But again, you know, the the people who write that show or the people who wrote it at the time, was it Manny Koto I think was involved at the time? I'm not sure. Um, is it Manny Koto? I think that episode might have been a Brandon Braga and Berman one, but uh, don't quote me on that. Yeah. Um, they are so good at very economically making, the, keeping the world the same. So that, I mean, the scripts are very good. It was very apparent when to, when to go and when to pull off it a little bit, you know, with a character like that. It would be very easy just to run around shouting and throwing people about, you know. Um, but the idea of the, the stroppy teenager is in there as well. And so to try and humanize him in the right moments when the script gave you it, gave you a bit of leverage when he did have to start getting a bit, you know, tough. And since you did just mention a few moments ago running around gassing folks in that episode Cold Station 12, uh, I'm curious yes. if you remember working with a particular actor in that episode, and that would be Richard Reilly. He was a guest on this show and he had some great stories. Uh, he played uh, Dr. Lucas in that episode. Do you remember anything at all that, about working with him? Is that the man who I put into the chamber? Uh, he didn't go in the chamber. He was one with the big mustache that you spent most of the time beating up in the chair. Yes. Uh, I remember him being uh, very relaxed about being someone in a scene getting beaten up. Cause sometimes <laughs> I've had to do that before and I've had it done to me. And sometimes if somebody's really not comfortable, it actually makes everybody a bit. Um, I do remember him not having a particular problem with this. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. Um, it was very, I remember thinking that was very violent for Star Trek, actually, Yeah. to be honest. Very kind of, certainly not, you know, Kirk in yellow and Spock in blue. You know what I mean? It was very, uh, I mean, occasionally William Shatner would punch somebody like, like and it looked like a Western. The double axe handle Western yeah. Superman punches, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not it's kind of a non-contact fight you know <laughs> you expect the blam boom you know the batman thing to appear but this was this was properly i mean it was there was a nastiness to malik 
Yeah, there was an area of the character. So yeah. I don't remember hanging out with Richard a, a, a lot, um, but I do remember him being quite relaxed about the the beating that he had to take. <laughs> Really well, let's talk happy. about another gentleman you got to spend a lot of time with on screen. That was Scott Bakula. And yes. not only did you get to perform with him, but most of your scenes are you two guys brawling around different places. So, number one, just talk to me about working with Scott and how to work with him in the fight scenes. And also, how much that was you guys, how much that was doubles? Quantum Leap was another show that I watched. And I was younger when that was on. Hmm. I watched Quantum Leap with my mother when I was, you know, very young. How can I put this? Scott Bakula's face was so ingrained in my consciousness from watching Quantum Leap as a, a little boy that I had to work very hard when I met him not to, like I was really, it was, it was a bit like a sort of prom date. I was like, oh, don't, I, I just wanted to be like, yeah, hey man, whatever. But inside I was like, a Scott Bakula, a Scott Bakula, oh my God, you know, um, deeply uncool, but desperate to kind of, you know, get Scott Bakula to think I was all right, you know? <laughs> um, so once I got over that, yeah, I'm an absolute professional. I mean, one of the um, things that I learned during my whole time in the States, and um, being very fortunate to do, you know, a lot of work, a lot of really great work and some not so great work, which is important too, because otherwise you don't know when it's good, is that there's a level of professionalism um, and it's different to in the UK. I think in the UK, because we have a stage tradition, there's all, with some actors here in front of a camera, there's always a bit of a hoodoo. Oh, what's the camera going to do? Is this going to be all right? American actors that know how to work on screen are like, a, there's a lot of learning, you know, so just, and Scott, as well as Brent, but Scott, um, just to be around him and watch him work, even if you're in the scene, there was almost like a little other I that I had even in the scene with him, you know, I'm um, going, what is it that I mean, just effortless, absolutely effortless. Um, and that's a tradition of acting that we don't really have in the UK. It's something I think that American actors do without even thinking about it. Um, and yet there's American actors say, well, how do you do that kind of stagey thing? How do you, you know, so there's a there's a mutual respect for the different directions that we come from. But so I was in awe of, of, of Scott and I was, I was a little bit nervy around him. I think I made a, a slightly um, kind of wisecrack comment about a set that was painted purple on one occasion. And he kind of looked at me and sort of went, Hey, come on. You know, <laughs> kind of don't, don't talk about the set. That's the set. That's a Star Trek set. Wake up, you know, cause I was, a, I was young, you know, I was, I was trying to pal up to Scott Bakula and it didn't quite work, you know. Um, and uh, we got to have a good go at the wire pull. Um, yeah. I think ultimately it was a stunt man, but um, he literally, we did everything except the moment where the body flies up against the, and, and hits the wall. We got very physical and at the time he, he was really into that, you know, there were no, no, no punches were pulled. It was, it was properly, you know, um, I had to hold him by the neck, you know, he wouldn't let me, he was trying to get away, you know, so, um, except maybe when we had to hit the mark, mark, you know, it was a bit. so yeah, um, we, we pretty much did everything that we could do that they were probably insured to let him do. Um, and yeah, just, you know, I had to keep kind of pinching and slapping myself to, you know, to be present, to do what I had to do, you know. Understand what's well, a heck of an experience to have. Yeah, you know, coming from where I come from, you know, I mean, I, you know, family moved down from Glasgow when I was four, and you know, I was sitting in my house. I was, was I seven, six, seven, eight, watching, you know, Scott Bakula in Quantum Lake. Well, Ziggy says you have a five percent chance of that, you know, all that stuff. The great Dean Stockton, bless him, and and it's a part of my. I didn't realize that it was uh, a a part of my sort of being from when I was a kid. And then and there I am, you sort of going toe to toe with, with Scott, you know? Um, I think there was a lot of, uh, at the time, I think the show, I think, what was it on UPN at the time? Yep, yep UPN. Um, I'm not sure what 
stage they were at with whether they were going to continue. I mean, I've since, I had never, I had never taken responsibility for a series TV, um, uh, you know, the lead in a series, a TV series, a network series. I have since done it and I sort of understand what the pressures are now. So I understand what Scott may have been carrying um, uh, to to have that level of responsibility and to feel that it was his show because it's very much Archer's show. Um, although all the other guys are great. I remember, is it Dominic? Dominic Keating, yep. He was wonderful and he's English. So uh, I think he's English, yeah. He was, he was wonderful. So, you know, we could talk about football and stuff like that <laughs> in the odd moment. But, but I, I, if you see what I'm saying, I, in, in hindsight, I suspect that Scott Bakula was thinking about, he had a lot of plates spinning, I think. Mm. Um, so to be as professional and as brilliant consistently as, as he was, you know, again, it's just learning, man. When you work with people like that, you just, you don't realize until afterwards either, you know, and sometimes years afterwards, but what a great, great privilege to be sitting here talking to you about time spent with actors like Scott and all those other guys. So Alec, the episode, The Augments, that was the final one you did in this trilogy here. That has a little more piece yeah. of Star Trek royalty in it, because that was also directed by LeVar Burton. And oh, I'm a yeah. big fan of LeVar, so tell me what it's like to be directed by him and just being around that man, because that's the guy I'm dying to get in this show. Whatever he says, you just do it. Uh, even if you don't really get it or you think it might not work, um, first of all, that rarely happened. But in the in the two or three occasions when it did, I just did it and I was like, oh yeah, okay, you understand, you understand this world, you understand this, you know, how this thing should be shot, uh, how these lines should be delivered, um, and, you know, you understand the the bandwidth of Star Trek, of this, of this, this version of the show as well, because they're not all the same, you know, they're very different, um, or slightly different tonally, you know, um, and LeVar really understands that and, you know, you don't need to talk too long about why. So, um, um, but also very detailed, you know, very detailed direction. Some some TV directors I find over the years, yeah, just do it, you know, we'll, we'll do it, we'll do it again, we'll do it again, we'll do it again, we'll do it again. You know, he would come in and chop away at a certain bit until, you know, there was a little bit of finesse. Um, and uh, I remember this scene where I think the ship is going down and Malik is badly injured and he's lying on that. I just remember lying on a control panel going oh my god i'm lying hurt i'm on a control panel in star trek <laughs> um really uh and you know he was really into he really he wanted a remembrance of uh montalban you know from the wrath of khan and that that sense and i loved that movie i think it's lots of people's favorite star trek movie the wrath of khan and that performance from that actor in that that at that time you know the thing with the ears that when he puts them in the check of and someone else's the horrible ears, wormy the things little, the little thing the steady eels yeah just like you know and the, the accent and the bearing i mean a very impressive man so i do remember me me and lavar talking before a take about that you know this is it this is that kind of you know give it that give it that size you know? mm. um so yeah again a, a privilege and again you know just pretending you know trying desperately not to be too uncool or look too excited <laughs> just, and probably failing you know that's what i'm doing right now i'm trying to hide my excitement but i'm doing a horrible job with that so uh you know i gotta also add since you just mentioned that scene with the control panel were you aware that that actually basically was a direct homage to the wrath of khan do you know what? I think I was. I think that's why subconsciously I, I, I answered the last question the way that I did. And LeVar was certainly, certainly aware. Uh, I think I'd forgotten, but I hadn't subconsciously. It was in. Um, yes, I was. Um, I mean, yeah, I loved that film. I mean, I watched The Wrath of Khan a little while after we... And funnily enough, I didn't... I was so aware of his performance in that that I didn't watch it before we shot. I always think that's a bad idea like watching Dune before you shoot your, but you know, it's just a bad idea. Um, uh, but I did watch it again a little while and it just made me, it's so joyous, like how good he is in that film, you know? So to have been on a set trying to reference that. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll take that. Thanks yeah, LeVar. <laughs> that's a pretty awesome thing to have. And, uh, yeah, you know, I'm curious cause we haven't really meant to ask this at all. There's, there's the rest of the interview, but, um, 
do you normally watch the stuff that you're in? Yeah. So did you watch these episodes? Yeah, Enterprise? I did. Two, well, Enterprise, definitely. I mean, the, the, I was going to say there are two reasons, but there are three when it comes to things like Star Trek. Um, the, the two reasons are, it's always, I, I believe as an actor, it's good to watch yourself back because your idea of what, what I don't like looking at the monitor on set. I don't like that. Mm. Yeah. I don't like it when there's like 50 people watching the show when it's being made. I can't, I'm not the director. So, um, but I, I do, I sort of breathe a sigh of relief when the director's like, can we not have the entire crew around the monitor after each take? That's not what we're doing, you know? Um, but I think watching your work is valuable after the event. Cause sometimes what you think you did, isn't quite what you did. Um, I, I see it sometimes as a, unless I had a really bad experience and then I'll watch it to check that it wasn't too career ending. Um, I, I feel like it would, you're robbing yourself of part of the joy of being part of a production. If you don't actually view it hmm. most enjoyably with the cast and crew around you, you know, it's a celebration of what you all did together for better or worse, but with things like star Trek, you've got to watch it just for fun. I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it to, to sort of, <laughs> I'm probably a terrible actor for saying this, but just to see yourself in, in something so kind of cool and already it was a part of me anyway, you know, and now I'm in it forever, you know, and my daughter who's, you know, three and a half will probably watch this thing in 20 years and go, dad, look at that wig or, you know, whatever, but, and she won't understand Star Trek in the same way that I do, but I bet you they're still making it in some form when she's, you know, when she, you know, goes to high school for that's for that's for sure and i'm kind of hoping that i'm so unrecognizable as malik that they'll they'll bring me back to star trek at some point <laughs> well listen we haven't even talked uh, about your your vo roles, roles of today. The are, you know. <laughs> yeah, we haven't even talked yeah, about your vo roles overall. today and, and you do a bunch of those but you know they are oh. doing animated star trek shows right so there is a shot if you want to stay where you are at home and do some of those maybe mm-hmm mm -hmm. gotta get oh, you onto it. prodigy or onto uh oh there you go yeah there's your road mic nice <laughs> also yeah. known as the savior of zoom during uh, the pandemic yes and also known as maybe i should have plugged it in at the start but never mind <laughs> so you know uh, i guess last thing here about the star trek stuff too uh, and i guess just to follow up on what you just said i mean what do you think of your performance as malik if you did watch it back i mean were you happy with what you did would you have changed anything uh, i don't know when the last time is that you've seen it but what do you think about what you did I, I enjoyed it i mean again it's it's so difficult for you go over to America as a Brit, as a Scot, but as a Brit, and, you, and you're working in like a franchise like that. It's really, really hard to just look at the work, pure and simple, because you, it's so much fun to watch it, you know. I mean, I remember the first time I saw the scene where Malik and um, one of his cohort, and that guy was an MMA fighter. The guy that, you know, we point the guns at the Klingons, and then there's a fight. I mean, I tried to do that kick, but I just kept landing on my backside. So <laughs> I double did it. But, uh, you know, you watch little sequences like that and you kind of, okay, cool. Um, I'm not going to sit here and try and be, you know, really cool about, yeah, I was in that. And yeah, you know, and an interesting stuff. There is a, you have to have the, the kid inside you at all times. Otherwise, if you can't get excited about it in that way, you put it somewhere, you don't bring it to work and go, Hey, isn't this great? You know, we're working and we're making Star Trek. You don't do that, but you have to have it because otherwise you're dead in the water. You may as well not be doing it. That's, that's my belief. And that applies, that applies for anything in the creative arts. If you don't have the, the kid that wanted to do it inside you at somewhere, um, it's, 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 it's sort of done, you know? And so with thing like Star Trek that it feeds that little kid, you know, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm an adult still talking about Star Trek, the same thing I grew up watching as a kid. So it's the same kind of feeling, you know, it stays with you. This is it. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a bit of Star Trek's a massive cultural benchmark. You know, all these shows are you know, Star Wars, Star Trek. I know that's a bit like Manchester United and Liverpool, but, um, I'll allow uh, it this time. <laughs> They all, all the best ones come from, you know, great human mythology, religious ideology. And it's, if you've got all that in there, you're, you're done. People are watching stories that they recognize without even knowing it. 
Yeah. So, Alec, as we get close to wrap up this interview today, I want to lightning round you real quick with a few questions here. So, no time to think. You just got to answer. Uh, but hopefully, <laughs> answers that are safe and won't get you fired from any future job. So, here we go. Uh, ah. Best gig you ever had and worst gig you ever had? Most fun I ever had on a gig was Strike Back. Um, just because it was like doing a James Bond film, but on a tighter budget, so it actually felt dangerous. <laughs> and the worst gig I ever had, um, that's a really, really tough one, but I'm going to say the musical of Desperately Seeking Susan, which closed after five weeks in the West End. What made it so hard? <laughs> I can't like, just walk away with that one. What was, what was so nightmarish about that one? It closed after five weeks. Uh, I met some incredible people that I'm still friends with today, so that's why I said it's a, it's a really tricky question. Mm. Um, I mean, every job has, you know, good and bad. And there are also things I've done that I think are great that everybody hated. So, you know, <laughs> so, it's a tough question to ask, but um, I, I can tell you that uh, Star Trek is up there, but I've never had quite so much fun as I did making um, that, that strike back show, oh. playing a Russian villain called Pavel Kuragin and running about, you know, trying to destroy the world. It was great fun. How about a moment from your performing career that was the most challenging for you at first, but ultimately became the most rewarding? Any first day of a rehearsal for a play. Hmm, okay. Any what makes first. it so difficult? It's just that you're trying you to get into I can't imagine how this is ever going to be something that you do eight times a week without really thinking much about it. But it always does. How about most valuable piece of advice that someone ever told you, whether it be about life or about acting, that you still hold on to and use today? uh what's for you won't go past you my mother she said it to me last week <laughs> so you definitely still use it today all right <laughs> well, last thing for today alec what is the best thing about being a part of the star trek universe i'm gonna i'll tell you a little story this is my best moment and it wasn't on set and i wasn't supposed to do it um the, 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 being able to tell this story is the best thing about being a star trek universe. I finished work one day and for some reason, I think they had shut the main exit uh, from the stage at, 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 from makeup at, at Paramount. So I had to sort of go through um, a cut through and the cut through was through the stage. And it was the stage that they had the bridge on. So I went, no, there's no one around. So I went on to the set and it was lit, but it was lit with, you know, the down lights, they were in standby mode. So it was a bit gloomy, but I thought, well, got to do this. I have to do this before I leave. You know, I think I had like two days on my contract left. So I went and sat in the captain's chair and did the thing. You know. Only for a few seconds, but I was like, yeah, this is magic. You know, this is great. I've got to get out of here. Um, and as I left the set, I went, Oh, and there's little security cameras all over the place. So somewhere, <laughs> somewhere these guys have footage of this idiot putting his bag down by Captain Archer's chair and going, yeah. Um, but no, it's, 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 um, it often takes my breath away um, when you hear fans talk about it. Because for me, it was a very intense and a very enjoyable three or maybe four weeks of my life. Um, but it's still around today in the um, imaginations of people. And that's really, really cool, particularly for a boy that grew up watching Star Trek and Quantum Leap. You know, you can't really get better than that. I just like watching you tell that story because as soon as you got to the part about the captain's chair, you just like totally turned into a child right there. I, I totally felt that glee. You know, yeah, it's uh, it was um, it was a, it's such a cool thing to have been involved in, you know. And the other surprising thing about Star Trek is I, I'm I'm absolutely convinced that when my daughter is twenty years old, they will still be making Star Trek. Yeah, when she's a hundred years old, they're still going to be Star Trek. Yeah, and maybe she'll be in it one day. I don't know. I'll yeah. see if I can persuade her not to pursue a career in pretending. And. <laughs> <laughs> But that wouldn't be fair because my father never did that to me and neither did my mother. So she can do what she wants and we'll support her. Well, Alec, thank you so much for spending time with us today and telling us all these great stories, sharing a lot of your knowledge about what you do, really breaking it down for us. 
And uh, yeah, it's truly been a legitimate treat for me to be able to talk to you today and spend this time with you. So thank you so much for being a part of Trek Untold today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for asking me to come on. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Until next time, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trek Untold, all one word. If you'd like to directly support this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter over on patreon.com slash trekuntold, which gives you access to some great perks that can't be beat. Or pick up some merchandise from our store, or use my Amazon shop link to check out all kinds of different Star Trek merchandise. Links for all these things are in the show notes. Shout out to Triple Fiction Productions for being a key sponsor of Trek Untold. Don't forget to check them out and all of the fine folks whose ads you've seen or heard on this podcast too. If you have any questions, feedback, or comments for the show, or would like to suggest a guest or discuss sponsorship options for any of these episodes in the future, send me a message at trekuntold at gmail.com. I hope to see you here again as we uncover more untold stories from Star Trek and beyond and get to know even more amazing people who have contributed to this ever-expanding universe. Until next time, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms, is powered by the RageWorks Podcasting Network, and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.